thank you so much. My pleasure. Hello, Stan. Without you, a lot, a lot of people wouldn't make it through, and that's a fact. I've been working with council centers for a while, uh, not ours so much directly, but I did my uh, pre-doctoral internship at Cook Council Center at Virginia Tech. I did a, a year-long internship at Appalachian State University, and we worked uh, with the housing staff at both of those places rather extensively and frequently because y'all are the front line of the university. You're the people who deal most directly with our students on campus who have, as you know, a variety of issues that come up. Uh, some that they bring with them and some that arise when they get here. And sometimes a combination of the two, which can be uh, dangerous or volatile or, or certainly distressing or hard to work with. And you all have a lot on your own plates as you do, in fact, have classes yourself. And you probably know you could run your halls almost a full-time job if you were doing it totally you know, focused on just that kind of work. Uh, but you can't totally focus on that kind of work. So the best you can do is be there for those students part-time. But we know that you are the front line to help out all the students. And by doing so, you increase their chances of success at ETSU. In fact, anywhere that housing staff are, that's the case. Uh, the fact that you have a lot on your plate means that you're highly stressed as well. Uh, we hope that you are getting enough training to be skilled at handling stress, more so than you would find in the general population. In fact, stress itself isn't that much of a problem. Stress is different than distress. Distress is when you feel like you are absolutely hamstrung and cannot handle it anymore. Stress is a motivator if used properly. It tells you something needs to get done, and if you're motivated to focus on whatever it is that needs to get done, you'll feel less stressed as soon as you're done with it. When you are overwhelmed with the number of stresses you have, you enter a state of distress, and that can be very difficult for people to deal with. And this will help with both states of distress and states of stress. Um, I'm glad that we're filming this because I've always wanted to film it formally. And in fact, we're doing the same presentation uh, for the athletic, uh, ETSU athletics the next Wednesday night. You're welcome to come to that at the call up auditorium or bring people or send people. And we'll do it again, whichever one's the best copy we'll wind up putting on the internet. Uh, because there's no reason everybody can't teach this. Anybody can teach these techniques. They're not difficult techniques. As we like to say, you know, it's not rocket science, but it is science. If you do it appropriately, it works always. It's rarely done appropriately. It's rarely taught. It's rarely understood what it is taught. So it's often used inappropriately or insufficiently. And for those people, it doesn't work. But if you know what you're doing, you can teach people to reduce stress in their lives in a big way. You can teach them how to uh, work their way out of panic attacks without drugs. And that's a pretty powerful thing to be able to do. And so I'm going to go through a variety of slides that I was preparing even five minutes before I arrived. Uh, so it's not as polished as I would like it to be, but it's all right. I've given this about 20 or 30 times over the years. And uh, so it's probably a little more organized than it typically is because it's the first time I've had a full on PowerPoint. So the things we're going to talk about today will include anxiety versus stress versus arousal, uh, physiological bases and effects of anxiety, anatomy and physiology, uh, <coughs> psychological and behavioral correlates of anxiety, practical applications, uh, techniques, two of them in particular for controlling stress and anxiety, and then if we have time and we may not, we'll do a demonstration session, maybe a brief one. Certainly I will demonstrate to you as we go through this, how to do it, whether we'll actually have time for me to sit down and run through that with you uh, is doubtful given that we only have an hour and I like to talk a lot. Anybody had my class before? So you know this to be true. Uh, so let's get on with it. Uh, anxiety can be thought of as a number of things. Some people call it nerves, nervousness, stress, arousal, um, but usually we think of it as an unpleasant arousal, because arousal is kind of a general term. It's not um, one that you could just label as one kind of arousal or another. Being awake is being aroused, right? So it's a state of consciousness. So it could be a positive state of consciousness. When you're excited, you have arousal, but it's a positive excitement, right? And when you're stressed, you have arousal, but it's a negative arousal. So uh, when we're talking about stress, we're usually going to be talking in this case about acute stress, intense, short-term state stress or state anxiety as opposed to trait or characteristic anxiety that people might experience frequently, possibly due to the, the way that they uh, conceptualize their world. 
so it can also be thought of as an experience of fear. So it's a negative state, it's an emotional state, but it has affective contents, it has behavioral contents, and it has cognitive contents, A, B, and C. Right? So the way that you uh, feel is related to the way that you behave and the way that you think. And so if you can change the way you behave and change the way you think, you can triangulate and change the way you feel, thus reducing stress or anxiety. Uh, physiologically, acute anxiety is simply an adrenaline response to a perceived threat. A real threat, you want an adrenaline response. A uh, non-real threat still may feel real. In fact, a lot of our threats are, are cognitively constructed. They're things we think about ourselves. They're negative thoughts or things we interpret about the situation that might otherwise be neutral. But we give a negative spin to. So I might walk into a situation that's a party and I don't know anybody and I think people are going to look at me weird because I'm dressed funny or they're not going to like me. Probably they're not caring whether I'm there or not, right? They haven't met me. They're not noticing me in particular, they're doing what they're doing, but I have a negative interpretation of the situation that makes me perceive it as a threat, in which case I'm gonna get my fight or flight response, which is the release of anxiety, uh, or excuse me, the release of adrenaline, which enhances anxiety, right? So I'm gonna start feeling physiologically uh, nervous, in addition to my cognitive state of worry, and the two together producing a sense of stress or anxiety. We talk a lot about adrenaline. Your body floods you with adrenaline as well as cortisol, but adrenaline is more correlated with the breathing technique we're going to be talking about and pH balance that we'll be talking about. It makes you feel really uncomfortable. So if you feel really uncomfortable physically, it's hard to get comfortable mentally, right? And the two kind of work on each other. And what does adrenaline do? It increases your heart rate, for one. And for reasons, as we'll see, that, that's normal and, and should be expected and can be managed. It also uh, may make you feel uh, nauseous or tingly or butterflies in your stomach because when you are experiencing a real threat, you don't need to process uh, digestion. So your digestion shuts off, right? You want to conserve all your resources and focus all your energy if you're dealing with a real threat. Some people get peripheral, peripheral vision, kind of uh, 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 fading away, tunnel vision, right? Other people get trembly on their, on their hands or they might get sweaty or, or, or uh, palms feeling kind of clammy because your blood shunts back from your extremities towards the core, which is a survival thing. All animals have this kind of response when they're in threatening situations and us being a rather advanced form of animal, we have it too. Again, if you need it, that's what you want. It's gonna be able to help you focus, it's gonna give you strength, it's gonna be able, you're gonna be able to do things that you would not otherwise be able to do. Adrenaline release in a real threat has beneficial effects. However, when not in a truly threatening situation, uh, it can induce a fear that feels like it comes out of the blue, like it comes out of nowhere. Now, if you step out in front of a, a truck without looking, you look up in the last second and see one bearing down, you're going to jump out of the way, and your heart's going to be racing, and you're going to know exactly why you feel like that, because you almost died, right? That's how you feel when you almost die. What happens if you have that exact same feeling and there's no truck? There's nobody attacking you, there's nobody doing anything. You just all of a sudden have this feeling like you're gonna die and you don't know why it's happening. It's very, very scary. Uh, as we tend to interpret fear, we look for plausible threats. So I might construct one. Oh, they think I'm, I'm gonna come up with negative interpretations of how people might be interpreting me to explain why I feel like this, but if I'm left without even that as an interpretation, well then it must be some internal health threat. I must be having a heart attack. Because I feel like I'm dying. What's the only thing that could explain me dying out of the blue when my heart's racing? Heart attack. I also have problems with breathing as a, as a correlate. We'll talk about that more directly in a minute. But that kind of feeling of pressure on the chest, the heart racing, feeling like you're gonna die, you're gonna go to the emergency room, and you're going to say, I'm having a heart attack. Well, that's a good idea. If you think you're having a heart attack, go to the emergency room. That's a first-line treatment of anything that seems to resemble a heart attack. Let them rule that out. They'll put you on the treadmill, do the stress test, and they'll tell you, no, it wasn't a heart attack. It was probably an anxiety attack or a panic attack, at which point you go, oh, good. That's good. Turns out this is useful in uh, dealing with coronary problems as well. But now you're dealing with something that's not chronic, that's not life-threatening. A panic attack may make you feel like you're dying, but you're not. 
You're not gonna pass out, you're not gonna freak out, you're not gonna die, although it may feel like all those things are gonna happen. So if you know this is the case, it's easier to deal with the issue at hand, which is the production of adrenaline. So people think, I must be going crazy. But you're not going crazy. You're having an errant adrenaline response, a fight or flight alarm that's going off without basis. And if you ever hear car alarms, <laughs> but nobody's breaking in, that happens like all the time, right? What do you wish you could do? Shut it off. Please, somebody give me a manual override button to shut that thing off because it's so annoying. That's what you need for your fight or flight alarm. When it's going off and nothing's happening, you need a manual override. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So, is it weird or abnormal? Are you going crazy? Are you a freak of nature? No. Everybody has anxiety. Everybody deals with stress. That's normal. Panic attacks are not normal, they're unusual, but about a third of people will have a panic attack in their lifetime. So ask yourself if you know three people, and then one of them will probably have a panic attack at some point in their lifetime. It doesn't mean they'll go on to develop panic disorder or even other related anxiety disorders, but just they'll have the experience at some point in their life of a feeling out of the blue that seems like uh, a terror has descended upon them, and they won't know why it's, it's happening. You will know what to do about it, and it won't surprise you. And you'll be able to help people who have this happen. So let's get down to the physiology of panic or anxiety. In the blood, you got a narrow pH balance, so everybody in here, being college students, probably understands what pH is. But I hope you put this up on the internet, not everybody may. So pH is really the balance between acids and bases in the blood. You have a very narrow window for homeostasis, right? Body's trying to maintain a balance. It wants to stay between 7.34 and 7.45. That's a very narrow window, right? Not a very wide uh, error of margin there, a margin of error. So you're slightly alkaline, slightly base. If you had perfectly uh, lab-produced water, its pH is 7, right? It's totally neutral. We're slightly base, but pretty neutral, but also within a very narrow window. If the blood pH drops too low, acidemia, the body will compensate by increasing breathing and expelling CO2, CO2 carbon dioxide. Got that from Wikipedia today. Sometimes Wikipedia can be helpful, but you don't want to cite it as an academic source because anybody can go on and change it at any moment. And that could have been wrong the second I looked at it. It would have been corrected really quickly because Wikipedia is awesome, but I won't cite it as an academic source, but it said it as well as I wanted to say it. So I just quoted them. Blood pH drops. Well then, you're gonna have to do something. Your body will do something to compensate for that to try to restore homeostasis and maintain that pH balance. Muscles run on uh, denison triphosphate, ATP. If y'all love the Krebs cycle, we will not be going over the Krebs cycle. It's incredibly difficult to understand, much less memorize. But it means they use oxygen to help make the ATP, and you need to get rid of the waste product, which is carbon dioxide. Those things are, are key in their tie, and particularly CO2 is key in the, in the pH balance of the blood, okay? And so, if that's the case, we're gonna look at what muscles are we talking about here? If you have panic, what happens immediately? Your heart starts racing. Your heart is a muscle. Matter of fact, it's almost all muscle, right? It's a big old muscle designed to pump blood continuously for a lifetime. So it's a very efficient muscle. But when you're also stressed and anxious, you're going to tense up in some other ways that you may not even be aware of. And so your muscles are tensing up. They're going to use more oxygen. They're going to produce more carbon dioxide. And that's going to put you out of balance. Now, when I say that you are not always aware of the tension that you may feel, I give me as an example. When I, before I went to community college or learned any of this stuff here, I was delivering flowers, which was a really cool job for me because it was not construction anymore. I only made minimum wage, but I could basically drive around all day listening to music, never having to carry anything heavier than a vase of flowers. Everybody smiled when they saw me, and it was kind of nice. Be construction in some ways for me. But I also was responsible for delivering to uh, probably the, as busy a section as Charlotte, North Carolina has existed during rush hour. That was, my, that was my route. And so I was really good at it, 
and or so I like to think. And I enjoy doing it well enough. And uh, I always was very efficient. I thought, well, I get 20, 25, 35 deliveries during rush hour before GPS existed, right? You have to look them all up and plot them, and you got to go, go, go while all this traffic's coming. And I started developing headaches during work. And I didn't understand why I was getting headaches during work. And I would go home and it would last an hour or two longer and eventually they'd fade away. And I'm like, that's weird. And so one day I was going to go eat at local restaurant. I went in to get my burger. And when I went to put it in my mouth, I had to pop my jaw open. Because as it turned out, and as I discovered in that moment, my jaw was clenched. Now, if you had asked me, do you feel stressed? I'd go, no, I'm busy. Right? Are y'all stressed? No, we're busy. Busy people, we know what we're doing, we're good at what we're doing, but that's a form of stress as well. And the way that I was carrying that stress was clamping my jaw. So I was driving around with my jaw locked, and that was creating tension headaches. And so I consciously stopped clenching my jaw, and my headaches went away. Right? And I didn't know what that was, but that's related. So there's a lot of negative physiological effects and even long term effects of stress. But one of the one effects of acute stress is that we tense muscles. And so thus, we're using up oxygen, and when we're panicking, we're really using up oxygen and producing more carbon dioxide. So we wind up breathing more rapidly, as I alluded to earlier, right? We start, some people hyperventilate, okay? So they're breathing quickly, and you think, well, they must be getting more uh, oxygen, and must be getting rid of more carbon dioxide, but not really, because they're only breathing to their upper chest. And as such, you know, you're gonna diffuse enough air downward to get oxygen to the place they need to be, and I'll show you where that is in a second. And you'll diffuse enough carbon dioxide upward enough that you'll be fine, but it's not gonna help you stop this cycle. In fact, when you start having uh, carbon dioxide rise and oxygen level plummet in your blood and you get blood acidosis, your base frame is really saying to you, hey, you're dying because you're out of homeostasis. And one of the things it does automatically to compensate is increase your breathing rate and increase your heart rate, which is gonna do what? Further deplete your oxygen and further uh, increase your carbon dioxide. It's got a negative feedback loop. It's called the sympathetic nervous division. It is kind of sympathetic with your problem. It floods you with the energy you need to deal with a, with a stressful, uh, threatening event. But sooner or later, it's gonna run out of energy and it's gonna to have to calm back down and that's gonna be the parasympathetic nervous system which is in charge most of the time, kicking back in, returning you down to normal levels, right? But if you're in a panic state and you don't know why you just panicked, you're still gonna be freaked out. Even though your physiological levels may have returned to normal, you're still tense, you're still worried, you're still frightened, you don't know what's happened, it's easy to trigger it again. Because you can trigger multiple anxiety or adrenaline releases. So when we get this shallow breathing, we're gonna have more carbon dioxide and less oxygen, so what we need to do is regulate the way we breathe. And that turns out to help tremendously because, I don't know how well you can see this, but up here in the upper uh, respiratory airway, you have smooth muscle, right? This is, you got trachea, you got bronchioles, and they branch out to smaller and smaller tubes, right? It kind of looks like broccoli upside down if you look at these little, the, end, the very end of it, you got these little tiny things that look like bubble wrap or broccoli uh, flowers or whatever, and that's called alveoli. That's where gas exchange takes place. That's where oxygen goes into the body and carbon dioxide comes out of the body. And if you look at the diagram, where is that going to be largely concentrated? In the bottom and periphery of the lungs, not in the upper respiratory tract, right? So if I'm going, I could breathe heavy, quick, and big, but I'm not getting much air down here. That's important. So you get people who hyperventilate. You ever seen anybody who hyperventilates and passes out? Yeah, doesn't happen often, but it happens sometimes. And what happens when they pass out? Their breathing returns immediately to normal. It's almost like the body goes, you're not breathing right, go to sleep. <laughs> Hit the reset button. Guess what happens when oxygen levels return and oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide levels return to normal? They wake right back up. 
So why not just do that? Why not just change the breathing yourself before you have to be reset? Right? Reset it yourself. Be the manual override. So the goal is to get oxygen to the bottom of the lungs. And while it's going in the body, carbon dioxide is coming out into the air that's filled up the lungs. And then to breathe that out. Now, everybody in here, go ahead and take a very deep breath. Wrong. It's always wrong. Everybody gets it wrong. Nobody gets it right except babies. When a baby lays on its back, you ever seen one go, <gasps> what's it do? Little belly goes up and down. Belly breathing. That's deep breathing. I don't know where we get it wrong. We start out breathing correctly, but I noticed that my son at age four, he's running, he's going, I'm like, wow, this is after I've been in grad school. I'm like, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Who knew? Right? Why are you breathing up here when your most efficient breath is down here? Now, some people get embarrassed by the way this looks. I don't get embarrassed, much to the sometimes consternation of some of my close friends and family. Uh, but it doesn't bother me to show you how you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to kick out that belly a long, long way. Kind of like you're on your little and you're like, look, I'm pregnant. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do, except in a controlled fashion. You want to go. All the way out. When I push out my stomach, what I've done is pushed out my diaphragm muscles, which have created a vacuum that sucks air to the bottom of my lungs. That's the way it's done. The only person I have not succeeded in teaching this to is my 90 year old grandfather, uh, who is a military man, chest out, stomach in, right? But he don't have breathing problems, he doesn't have anxiety problems, so it wasn't worth pursuing him. Turns out it helps a lot of other stuff, as we'll see. That's what you want to do. Really slowly in through the nose. And then I want to do an equal and opposite reaction. And kick it out. If I take a deep breath in normally, lungs are filled, and I expel normally, feels like I'm done breathing, but I'm still talking. You can't talk about air if I go. I make a breathing noise last bit. <laughs> You'll see that there was actually a lot more air left in my lungs when I thought I was done breathing out. It's stale air. It won't hurt you, but it's carbon dioxide rich and oxygen poor, and it's taking up volume. So what you want to do? Full breath in. Take it to the bottom of the lungs. Fill it up. You feel the ribs expanding, but you don't see the chest heaving. And then when I breathe out, I want to pull in and up on the diaphragm. Clear out. Now you can do it without being that obvious, but you wouldn't understand what I was doing if I wasn't being that obvious. You can sit there and you can breathe like this. <laughs> it's big. <laughs> right? You can do it sitting down. If somebody goes, what are you doing? You can go, I don't know. <laughs> you get anxious or panic if you want to, and you go, oh, I'm breathing correctly. You breathe wrong, I guarantee it. Let me show you how to do it. <laughs> That's what I hope y'all will do as staff members at ETSU, right? I hope you'll train people how to do this. Because it turns out that if you do it correctly, long enough, it works. It always works. Most people don't do it correctly. I've dealt with people who uh, say, oh, I, the paramedics and the, and, and the ambulance taught me that breathing stuff. It don't work for me. And I said, take a deep breath. And guess what they did? Wrong. If you do it wrong, it won't work. Because you're not getting at the heart of the physiology of the issue that we're trying to address, which is to increase oxygen and decrease carbon dioxide. Also gives you something very concrete to focus on rather than catastrophic thoughts. Something very concrete to focus on is a helpful thing on your panic. So let's talk about some of the uh, psychological and behavioral correlates of anxiety. Y'all can yawn too, by the way. Go ahead and yawn big. If you've been in my class, you know I prefer people to yawn and reel than pretending to yawn, where they like to draw. <laughs> <laughs> the fear of making it. You know, I don't care. I know you're tired. Yawn. In fact, the longer I do this, usually the more relaxed people get, even though I'm kind of loud. Because they start doing this stuff while I'm talking about it, and they start relaxing. And if you fall asleep, that's okay. 
In fact, if I had time to demonstrate it, it's not unusual for people to fall asleep while I do it. They don't get hypnotized or freaked out. I just say, if you're asleep, you can wake up now if you want to. Most of them just kind of go, oh, wow. They become very relaxed, just doing the breathing stuff. When you need it, as I said, adrenaline rush is a great thing to have. Uh, it gives you focus, gives you strength, gives you endurance, gives you speed, gives you physical protections like blood to the core of the body to deal with whatever life-threatening situation might happen to come up that you need to deal with. When you don't need it, the addition of it to any situation is likely to make it feel much worse. Exceptions include thrill seekers. Some people are adrenaline junkies. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Most people, you'll find, have a normal distribution on almost anything. Most people don't like adrenaline rushes when they don't need them. Some people do. And they go out of their way to jump out of airplanes with sheets tied to strings <laughs> and stuff to get it. Love it. And so, more power to them. Nothing wrong with that. If they dig it, that's great. I actually kind of like adrenaline, which is nice for me because when you get in front of a bunch of people to talk, guess what? Get a little bit of adrenaline. And when you have a 15-year-old learning to drive, you also get a little bit of adrenaline. So instead of me freaking out, I go, what are you doing? I just go, oh, wow, that was close. <laughs> so we don't go with that catastrophic interpretation of the situation. We just go, wow, that was really dangerous. But I'm glad you had that well in hand, because I thought that you would, right? So I want to make sure that I'm going to get rid of catastrophic thinking, which gives these interpretations that something is horribly wrong. And if you have an interpretation that something's horribly wrong, even if it isn't, you're going to get nailed with adrenaline, which is going to make it feel like it's horribly wrong, whether it is or it isn't. Unless you're a thrill seeker, in which case, enjoy. Our base brain will interpret situations as real threats when in fact there's no threat or only a perceived threat based on negative thinking, like somebody won't like me. Uh, our four brains will tell us it isn't a real threat. But the release of adrenaline makes us think a threat is more likely. So we make threat interpretations. That's the basis of phobias, really. A phobia is an unreasonable or rational fear for adults that, when we're talking about adults, who understand it is unreasonable or rational. In other words, somebody goes, I know I shouldn't be afraid of that because I know in a probability sense it isn't likely to happen. Nonetheless, I feel like it is, and I don't want to have anything to do with it. Right? I don't want to. And a lot of people have phobias, but you won't necessarily find out what they are. If I had a fear of elevators, for example, I might not work in a 100-story building. And so you would never know. If, if I did have that fear, I might take the stairs and have amazing leg muscles. Right? I would find ways around my fear, and other people wouldn't necessarily know that I have that fear. Sometimes you get stuck in situations, like you have to do a presentation for a meeting, and for a job, and you have to get through a fear, and you can kind of plow your way through it, but you're not happy or comfortable while you're doing it, right? And so the idea here is that your forebrain has a sense that you can do this, while your base brain is just going alarm, 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 which makes it very hard to focus and deal with whatever task it is you're trying to get done. When you have an adrenaline rush in any type of situation, if you've been in my class, you know about classroom conditioning, operant conditioning, we hit this many times because there are very few things that have more practical significance to people than how to manage stress and anxiety and how to understand it. We talk about classroom conditioning, that's Pavlov's dogs and things like that. We talk about operant conditioning, as B.F. Skinner and others. Uh, but ultimately, when you have an adrenaline rush, when you have a fear experience, you become classically conditioned to have a potential adrenaline release in any similar situation. So if you were physically attacked on a street corner downtown and hurt, what would happen the next time you went to that street corner downtown? Your heart would start racing. And you may not even really put two and two together, but because that's such a pronounced reason for having fear, you probably would, right? You would see why that is. But at present, on that corner might have been a street light, it might have been, I don't know, a mailbox. It might have been walking somebody, uh, or you know, display in a window of, of, of a red coat. Stuff that you're not consciously aware of because you're being attacked, and all your focus is on that moment, right? Later, you go walking around and you go by a mannequin with a red coat in Walmart. And all of a sudden, your heart starts going. You have no idea what's happening. 
all of a sudden, something feels terrible to you. And what's happened is the red coat was a previously neutral stimulus. It got paired with an unconditioned stimulus, the attack, and it's causing the adrenaline to be released. From your point of view, you're freaking out for no reason, which is scary as can be in and of itself, right? So anything in the environment can become a conditioned stimulus to start releasing adrenaline. And when you're in those kinds of situations, you, you don't want to be in them, right? People are motivated to reduce the bad feelings that come along with pain. What's the easiest way to get rid of pain? Leave the situation that causes it. Get out. <laughs> Fight or flight. That's what it's called. In the animal world, unless you're doing a, a, a mating routine, flight is always preferred, preferred to fight. Right? Because fight means you get injured. And in the wild, that's always bad. Right? And you don't go to animal hospital and fix it all up. You try to avoid injury at all costs, right? So fight is always the least preferred option, unless there's something on the line, like mating or pride or, or, or you know, helping somebody out of a bad situation, right? In those cases, you might have altruism or other kind of motivators driving behavior. But flight is the easiest way to get rid of the feeling. Get away from whatever's causing it, and you feel better. So that becomes a negative reinforcer in operant conditioning. It makes it more likely that the next time you come near a situation that's similar, you'll just avoid it altogether. You won't go into some kind of situation like that. And so you get Maurer's two-factor theory of a classically conditioned acquired adrenaline response, the operantly conditioned avoidance response so that you don't go near those. And because you don't go near them, you can't extinguish the adrenaline response. If you could get into that situation, going down to that street corner again, where an attack isn't going to happen this time, and you can stay there long enough and get calm enough, you'd be less likely to experience that drone rush in that situation next time. The more you do it, the less likely you are to feel it. So you're basically retraining your brain that it's not, in fact, a threatening situation. It was a random threatening person who happened to be in this relatively neutral situation, not the corner itself that caused the attack. So your brain's just trying to protect you. So it learns fear-based situations quickly. One trial learning, and it can be uh, something that lasts a lifetime unless you do something about it. But because you can't be deeply relaxed and anxious at the same time, if you're feeling anxiety but you're not actually in a threatening situation or some manageable threat like driving or flying or performing, you can negate the anxiety response by engaging in relaxation techniques. Now most people go, oh man, you're either laid back or you're not. They see relaxation as a trait. You're either a laid back person or you're not. Now this crowd is straight up type A, I'm sure. <laughs> How many people go, let me go to school full time and then get a job where I help everybody else manage their issues? <laughs> right? That's a type A personality. Y'all are achievement motivated. That's good. That's awesome. It also comes with it stress because you take on more and more stuff. That's kind of a function of maybe your personality, things that are characteristic of you. But it turns out that being laid back isn't a personality trait. It's something you can acquire. It's a skill set. And if you teach yourself skills and do them regularly, you can apply them in such a way as to make yourself a more quote unquote laid back person. Relaxation is the basis for the effectiveness of several treatments for phobias, post-traumatic stress disorder, panic disorder, etc. If you got any of these issues, or if you wind up in contact through your job, family, or friends with anybody who may have some issues like these, they'll want to find a cognitive behavioral therapist, a CBT therapist, who's familiar with and understands systematic desensitization and exposure therapy. Turns out all of these things can be alleviated most effectively without drugs. Some types of disorders do warrant drug treatment. These, however, do not necessarily warrant it. And in fact, that can be problematic. The use of drugs to treat something that you could treat through psychological methods uh, could create two problems instead of one. And I won't go into that today. Uh, the classical conditioning paradigm, for those of you who've had the class already noticed, there is an acquisition period. Well, for fear-based learning, it happens in one trial. I got attacked. That corner was previously neutral. Now that corner produces adrenaline. So adrenaline release with unconditioned stimulus being attacked. Now the previously neutral stimulus, which was the street corner, comes to produce the exact same reaction. I have an adrenaline response. 
to a previously neutral stimulus. If I stay in that, in that situation, eventually it'll go away. It'll go away. That's the basis of treatment of phobias, systematic desensitization, exposure therapy. I keep people in the situation that they most fear, but I give them coping techniques to help them with that. Help them calm their own cells down, stop their own adrenaline responses, and the longer they do that, and the more frequently they do that, it's gonna help that adrenaline response go away. However, sooner or later, down the road, randomly, spontaneous recovery will happen. You might walk by a similar street corner, even though you've been rid of this phobia for, for a long time, and all of a sudden, it just kind of comes back. Well, if you flee from that situation, it's as if you never extinguished it, because the base brain will take it as confirmation that it was right to give you drilling to begin with, that it was a threatening situation, and so the next time, boom, you're back to pre-extension levels. But if you know what's coming, if you're intelligent, you go, oh, this is just a spontaneous recovery of a conditioned reaction. I may not even know what it is in the environment that's triggering it, but I know that this is an errant fight or flight response, and all I have to do is stay in the situation, never leave the situation until you're fully calm. Calm yourself entirely, and it will go away faster and stay away longer. It's not rocket science, it is science. It works. It's been researched since uh, Bowlby and Mary Cuffer Jones back in the 20s and beyond, the stuff works. We know this. In terms of performance, however, we're talking about a little bit of a different thing because performance anxiety has a bit of a real element to it. One of the more difficult things to treat is people who have driving phobias because they were in a crash, for example. Anybody ever, well, you don't have to disclose this if you don't want to, but if you've ever been in a crash, and then the next time you got in the car, you felt a little weird. You can say it then. That's normal. That's exactly what this is designed to do. Your base brain's going, cars are threatening, and they are, right? So here's some adrenaline to deal with the threat. When it drives to the level of phobia, people can't get in the car. In other words, the anxiety is so strong, they can't drive. They feel too hampered by the anxiety get back in the car. If we get them back in the car, and if it didn't have another crash, another unconditioned stimulus, and did it again and again and again, the anxiety would go away, especially if aided by these techniques of learning to relax oneself. So sometimes situations have natural, um, I guess, factors about them that make them somewhat threatening, but not very threatening. So when you get up in front of people, you might make a mistake. You might have your fly open, right? You might just make your PowerPoint minutes before you show up. Those things are possible, so people might negatively evaluate you based on that, and so it wouldn't be totally unreasonable to have a negative thought about how people might interpret you. Now, in the case of public speaking, I like to look at it in a couple ways that help me. Some people go, imagine the audience in their underwear. I'm not doing that to y'all. No thank you. Uh, but what they're trying to do is, is have the speaker kind of alleviate their own anxiety by recognizing the humanness of everybody around, right? That anybody else in a similar situation would feel the same way. It would be normal to feel a little bit odd getting up in front of a bunch of people. Jerry Seinfeld at least said it was the number one uh, fear in America when he did his Seinfeld episode, and then death was number two. And so he concluded that he would rather be in the coffin than delivering the eulogy. Right, because it's just weird. But some other things you can do is just kind of recognize that people, when they're up here, they're gonna do what they're gonna do. Most of us are on a normal distribution. No matter how good I do my talk, some people are gonna hate it. Not many, but some. No matter how bad I do my talk, some people are gonna love it. Not many, but some. But in both cases, most people just don't care. <laughs> they're here because they have to be here. They're here to get food. They're going, gosh, what are gonna get done? They're thinking of things that really don't have a lot to do with you, right? They're not really negatively evaluating you. So the worry that they are is pretty much unfounded because some of them are gonna love it anyway. Some of them are gonna hate it anyway. So it doesn't really matter what you do, which is kind of freeing if you think about it. So it frees you to do the best. But if I got high levels of adrenaline, for any task, sports tasks, anything really, that's going to interfere because I might have physiological things like heart racing, difficulty breathing, and cognitive distractions like catastrophic thoughts or I'm going to blow this shot or, or whatever is going to happen is going to be bad. And those are going to interfere with my focus on the task. So it turns out though, 
that we do need some arousal. For tasks that are well learned or easy, stuff you do a lot, maybe you do a lot of practice and you do it well in practice, a moderate amount of arousal and maximizes performance. It's the Yerkes Dotson law of arousal that your best performance is when you have moderate levels of arousal. You got the other end of that, where low arousal means there's not any investment or energy devoted to the task. This gets related to test anxiety. People with test anxiety have usually overprepared for the test. They're very worried about how they're gonna perform the test. They're motivated, that stress has motivated them to do a lot of studying. And then they get into the situation, and for whatever reason, at some point in their life, it's been, a bit, uh, it's been associated with a very negative thing, and all of a sudden, they get a little adrenaline, a little nervousness. And they go, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to remember anything. And then they get more adrenaline. And they go, oh, I'm, I'm forgetting things. I'm drawing a blank. They get more adrenaline. And guess what? Self-fulfilling prophecy. All the information's in there. But their arousal levels are so high that they can't access it. They're so distracted by their physiological and cognitive state that they can't really get to the information that they want to use for their test. They walk out and the whole thing's over. And they can tell you anything you want to know about the test. For the people who have low arousal, they're going to flunk the test, but not because they studied, because they're going to be like, oh, dude, you got a test today. <laughs> oh. oh, well. No arousal. They're not motivated by the evaluation component of a test anyway. They didn't study. They're not ready for it. And who cares? So in both cases, you're going to have low performance, but it's for very different reasons. So what you want to do is do all the studying, but then get moderate levels of arousal, more than none, you don't want to be asleep, but not peeking and tweaking either, because then you won't be able to deliver the goods. But you got the goods. The trick then is to learn how to manage arousal and stress so that one keeps it at optimal levels while engaging in various tasks like public speaking, sports performance, and so on. That's the European Johnson Law of Arousal, inverted you. It ain't really that complicated, is it? Performance quality, low, high. Low arousal, Low anxiety, low performance. High anxiety, high arousal, low performance. Moderate levels, highest performance. Now, when I teach this to people and have time to go through the, the process of demonstrating it to them, I said, I mean, men can go to sleep. In other words, we've all got a moderate level of arousal because we're awake, right? But then, as we learn these techniques, we get lower and lower and lower levels of arousal so we're almost asleep, which is fine in practice. If you're having a panic attack, though, that's not going to happen. You're not going to sleep. But if you use the same amount of technique, you're going to go back to moderate levels. Very straightforward if you know what you're doing. Most people, of course, as I said, do not. So, does this stuff work? Really? I keep saying it works. But who am I to tell you anything? So, let's look at the literature a little bit. Researchers reviewing the literature concluded relaxation training proved to be a valid treatment option for many anxiety-related disorders and thus should be suggested to all people with anxiety-related complaints. 2010 reference there. I said it goes all the way back to the 20s. Let's look at some other stuff. Breathing techniques, both alone and paired with other techniques that are, uh, help you relax, have been shown to help with panic attacks, preoperative anxiety, test anxiety, stage fright, depression, sport performance, essential hypertension, angina, cardiac rehabilitation, asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, COPD, sleep quality, pain control, quality of life, and even typing skills. <laughs> That's pretty impressive list of stuff, if you think about it. And I can take a moment to point out how this thing could possibly be of help to people with COPD and asthma. Especially asthma as, as, a, as an example, when you have asthma, your airways constrict, right? The tubes constrict. It makes it difficult to pass larger volumes of air down to the lungs where they need to be. Because you have this feeling of, I can't breathe well, and because you are coupling it with a lower uh, rate of oxygen intake and a higher rate of carbon dioxide reduction but not release, you can start to feel like you're suffocating. And you can start to panic. In which case your what? Fight or flight response kicks in and it makes it very difficult to breathe, right? It, it can seem absolutely critical like you're gonna die. My daughter had that. And it's a serious thing when it happens to you. But it turns out that you don't really need big wide open airways to breathe sufficiently. 
This is from a pen. I just took apart a pen. That's all it is. When you're breathing correctly to the stomach and releasing all through the diaphragm pressing in, you can get all the air you need to live on through this tube here, which is far smaller than your trachea. All right? I'll demonstrate. I don't care for this. that all day if I wanted to, I don't. <laughs> but I could. In fact, using these techniques, I can get my breathing rate down to two breaths per minute. That's not some kind of yogic, magical trick. It is the fact that by breathing in a controlled fashion, I get so much oxygen on the breath and clear out so much carbon dioxide on the breath that I don't need to take more than two breaths a minute. Now, I have to sit and focus to do it, but it tells you something. Normal breathing is between 8 and 12 breaths per minute. I can reduce it to 2. So if you're having a COPD problem or you're having an asthma attack, if you breathe to your stomach, you will maximize the intake no matter what size the airways are. In the case of COPD, you're losing alveoli, so the more air you can get down to where they're at, the better off you are. So it works for a lot of stuff. Oh, pain control. I now have a fully gold tooth back here. Please don't. Love being robbed in there. Um, it's right back there. It's really pretty. Um, it cost a lot of money. I think they all cost a lot. It's just not that much gold, but it sure is pretty. Now I've had that tooth drilled out now five times. First time they put in a filling, fell out three days later. So I went to a different dentist. I wanted to say. But to the next guy, and he put in a filling, but he drilled it out further, and he put in a, a better filling. It lasted a few years, but it rotted underneath. Right? And so what a perfect job. And then so then my next guy, who is my guy, and I will tell you who that is, that's Dr. Method. I would recommend Dr. Method to anybody. He comes in and he's like, wow, you know, I can do something with that. He put in a filling, but he recommended to me that maybe I should do something a little more drastic. And I like, nah, let's do the least thing possible. And uh, so he put in a filling and I, I cracked it myself. I was eating salad and there's a little piece of bone in the bacon bits. And I Nailed it in a snap, swapped it right off. So then he's like, you know, you're really like to sit a crown. Says, is there anything else we can do? He goes, yeah, I can do an overlay. I said, let's do that. So we did an overlay. And then I was eating a sugar daddy at Thanksgiving. <coughs> and it pulled it right off. And it cracked some of the tooth with it. So now I got the crown that he recommended the first time. But each time I had my tooth grilled out, I took no anesthetic at all. No gas, no nose pain. And that goes back to a childhood experience with braces. It's my sticking my gums with a needle that I never want to have again, which is a classically conditioned aversion. But I'm not going to operately condition fix it because it turns out I don't need to. And the second time, Dr. Meffer said, um, how do you experience this? And I said, do you mean it doesn't hurt? He's like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, it hurts a lot. You're drilling a nerve with a Dremel tool, essentially. It hurts a lot. But what I'm doing is controlling my breath. And I've got my fingers clasped, he's got my mouth chopped open so I don't bite his finger off. And when he hits that nerve, I just clamp down hard, tense the muscles really tight, and keep on breathing. Focus on the fact that that's just a nerve signal, saying there's something wrong, there's something wrong, there's something wrong. But there's not something wrong. You're fixing what's wrong, and all I gotta do is stay calm and relaxed. So for people with chronic pain, this also helps. It helps with all kinds of stuff. Soccer. Taught kids how to play soccer. It turns out if you breathe like this, you get winded and your lungs feel like they're on fire. You go down to you know, the field going, <laughs> <laughs> it looks funny, but the few kids I could convince to do it came up to me later and I'm like, dude, it works! No! It's funny how it works, man. Muscles get used, oxygen feeding the fire. Good stuff. So you teach all kinds of things. Edward said, given the abundant evidence for their value, and power in various forms and contexts. 
Breaking skills may be regarded as the original method of survival, energy control, illness prevention, health promotion, and improving quality of living. That says a lot. That's why I focus on the breathing techniques. There are other techniques. Self-hypnosis, uh, we'll talk about progressive muscle relaxation, visualization, uh, biofeedback, there's other stuff you can use. But for my money, the breathing's where it's at. And it's where it's at for all the reasons I just told you. There's a solid physiological basis for understanding it. That's important. Simply telling somebody you can make the panic attack go away doesn't didn't work that well. You gotta give them rationale, right? Breathing correctly, very deeply, consistently, persistently will help you calm your body in situations when you feel anxious. You can train yourself to be deeply relaxed and you can't simultaneously be deeply relaxed and anxious at the same time. If you can control your body's reaction, you can better control your automatic negative cognition, the thoughts you have, because now you're calm and you don't need to interpret this physiological arousal. You can be more rapid. Systematic breathing and muscle relaxation do very concrete things to focus on. So instead of freaking out about what somebody might be thinking or anything like that, you're going, breathing, counting my breath in. Am I going all the way out? Expelling, am I expelling all my air out, right? Tensing this muscle, breathe, tensing that muscle. Breathe. Something very, very easy to focus on instead of freaking out. If you can control your bodily responses and your thinking, you'll feel you're in more control in the situation, and thus you'll be able to better handle all the city situation. Guess what? This also works for anger control. How many people, how many people does it take in the minimum to fight? Right, you got two people to fight. What if somebody's trying to goad you into fight? Fight game, argument, right? If you're totally unaroused by it, you're less likely to be goaded into that kind of a situation. You're more likely to take control of it. And in that situation, you'll be the only rational person in the room. Don't get pulled into conflict. Don't be made, made to feel lesser than, right? Don't get angry. That's not something you can just say to people. It's something you can learn and develop. Do I still get angry? Yes. But I get less angry, less frequently, it lasts less long, I'm much more quick to come to my senses about things and make amends if I am in the wrong and admit that I'm in the wrong. Right? When you can calm your body down, think about the last time somebody uh, verbally attacked you. Did you feel really calm? No, you felt upset physiologically and cognitively. If you can handle one element of it, it's easier to handle the other element. Doesn't mean you won't be angry. Counting to 10 doesn't mean anything except make you angry at 10. <laughs> you have to master deep relaxation, which is a skill. It takes lots of practice. You have to apply it in all anxiety producing situations and stay there in those situations. If you don't do them, they won't work. If you don't do them correctly, they won't work. If you don't do them long enough, they won't work. If you don't practice them, you won't think to use them when you need them. When you're having a panic attack, you don't really feel, oh, I should breathe differently, right? But if you practice this every day, you'll go, oh, I should breathe differently. Now, I'll give a quick example, real quick. Uh, I had a guy come in clinically, uh, and, and I worked in family medicine clinic, and he had a history of narcotics abuse, and he had an anxiety disorder so bad that he was actually morphophobic and was housebound. But he was clean, he was off of narcotics, but they weren't gonna give him medication to treat his panic disorder keeping him at home. So he came in and he saw me and I taught him exactly what I'm about to teach you. All right? And at the end of the session he's like, yeah, well my mom is on uh, beta blockers, which is used for blood pressure control. All right? And my, my grandma's on them too and it seems to work for them. They both had panic problems as well. But couldn't I get those? I'm like, yeah, I guess you could. Or we could just do this. He's like, I'd like to try those. So patient autonomy first. I got a physician who prescribed beta blockers. And we sent our patient home. Next week he came and he was having a panic attack in the office. And I said, good. Because guess what he did during the week in between? Did he do any of my techniques? No. He worked on nothing. He tried to hope for the beta blockers to give him the same effect that he gave his mom. Now, if it's a placebo effect or if it's a real effect, it doesn't matter. It worked for her, it didn't work for him. So he's having a panic attack, and I said, okay, just sit down, let's go through this. Close your eyes, deep in through the nose, stomach rises way, way, way out, chest stays the same, out through the mouth, complete exhalation, in and up on the diaphragm. And we did that for about four minutes. At the end of it, I said, how do you feel? He's like, I feel a lot better right now. I'm like, that's great. I want you to know that you just did that. 
No drugs, by yourself. I didn't do it to you. I just guided you through the process. So note that you can go from panic attack to normal in four minutes just by breathing. It took that kind of a demonstration to get this person convinced that it could be done. Because just telling them they can breathe this way out of a panic attack sounds silly, but it works. But you gotta do it like this. A lot of people like, it's not working, they don't do it wrong. Right? They quit doing it. You gotta do it wrong, right? You gotta do it regularly. Do it right, reliably every time, your anxiety will become manageable and possible. So, breathing through the nose turns out to be a good thing. It's not necessary to technique, but it's the way we're designed, actually. Nasal passages are there for a reason, right? You know, I guess it helps if someone puts their hand over your mouth, gives you another way to do it. Breathing thing, but, you know, they got, what? They got little hairs in them, they got mucous membranes, it voices the air. And it cleans the air, and that's good. It warms it up. So breathe in through the nose, particularly for people with asthma. That's important, breathing in through the nose. Everybody else, not so much. What is important is slow and controlled breathing. And so that's what I want to emphasize here. If you want to breathe in through the nose, all they want to have. You're not going to try it Slowly filling the lungs from the bottom to the top, one hand on your stomach and one hand on your chest to gauge your breathing. The chest should remain relatively still, so your chest hand won't move much. The stomach should rise quite a bit. The bottom of the lungs is where gas exchange is the most efficient of all we breathe through upper lungs, so it will take time to do this because it's a rather dramatic change. You just want to do this? Hold it down like that, it's important. Hold your breath when you take it in as long as it's comfortable. So I'll breathe in. Well, for me, breathe in for a pace of eight, I held for two, and then I let it out. Exhale through the mouth in a slow and controlled fashion, or as long or longer than your inhalation. In through the nose, out through the mouth that helps clean the air, warm it up, and learn better control when it's not necessary. When you finish breathing out, pull in and up on your diaphragm, your abdomen, which is why it's called deep abdominal breathing, to get out that last bit of stable air. Doing that consistently is important. And so it helps with sleeping. Now, with the aggressive muscle relaxation, first you're going to start breathing for a few minutes until you get it down to a very steady pace. And then you're just going to tighten muscle groups along with the breathing. That's all it is, really. Aggressive muscle relaxation, you're just going to take a group of muscles and tense them up really tight. Why? Because it has a paradoxical effect of making them relax. And it isn't hard to think about that. If you think about it, what happens after you push the weights downstairs? Over and over and over. When you use those muscle groups, you tighten and release them, 
They get higher. If you ran up five flights of stairs, how would your legs feel at the top of the stairs? It'd be wobbly, right? You'd want to sit down, and they would immediately relax, right? And so the idea is that if you put the, if I was to measure muscle tension on a myograph, and, and I have some tension because I'm awake when I have no uh, consciousness and totally asleep, I'm floppy, right? But if I'm awake, I gotta hold my body up, and so there's some muscle tension. And I can measure that, and when I tense my muscles really, really tight, of course the graph would shoot way up high, as long as I held that tension consistently. But when I let it go, it's not gonna just drop the baseline to below baseline. And so what I'm doing is making my muscles relax by tensing them up. It also makes you more conscious of the muscles themselves, which for me was, where do you hold your stress? You don't probably know. I certainly didn't know until I found out by accident. But if you're starting to tune into all your muscles, you'll quickly find out where your stress is. Some people hold it in the lower back. Some people move their arm out of the leg like that all the time. I'm one of those two. This goes all the time. Normally, it's not the stress. It's just um, what it is. Happens. So you figure out where it is. Think of each muscle group from toe to head, feet, calf size, buttocks, stomach, lower upper back, chest, shoulders, hands, forearms, arms, neck, head and face, Gaze the tension level. Become aware of your body, right? See what your tension level is at normal or when you're stressed. Concentrate on one group at a time, feet first. Doesn't really matter what order, but that's the idea of progressive muscle relaxation. It simply means you progress through the group systematically. Tense the muscles as you inhale. Be gentle if you've got back problems. If you're tensing your back, be very careful there. Hold the clenched muscles as tight as you can without causing pain while you're holding the breath. And then when you're ready to release the breath, say to yourself, relax. Release the breath as you've been doing it. Expel the last bit of stale air and let the muscles go limp. The reason you say relax and you do it over and over and over is because it can become a cue word that triggers relaxation. All you're doing is pairing a word with relaxing, pairing a word with relaxing. It can be any word you want, but it's a stimulus in your head so that when I get ready to go teach in front of 320 people the first day of the semester and I'm walking across campus to do that, I get a little bit of a butterfly thing going on in the stomach, but I don't go, oh my God, they're going to hate me. I don't make a negative interpretation. I go, ooh, butterfly is cool. I don't get those very often. I make a positive interpretation. And then I say, relax. And immediately, my muscles go kind of limp and my breathing changes to correct breathing because that's what I've been conditioned to do. I've been doing this for over 10 years. And then when I get on the stage and get ready to do it, I have arousal, but it's not too much and it's not too little. It's managed right in the middle and I can direct that into teaching. So I'm channeling the energy that's provided to me by the situation into enhancing my performance, I hope. At least in my mind, that's right. So that's what you're going for. Follow the stable pattern of breathing, muscle releasing, tensing with the breathing, using whatever keyword you want to use over and over, you can piece, whatever, doesn't matter. It'll eventually become a keyword that helps you immediately achieve that state. Systematic tension releasing muscle group, along with your breathing patterns, you do this all the way up to body, head, and face. As you relax, you may feel some sensations in your muscles like tingling or temperature change or weight change in your extremities like your toes and your fingers. That's normal. When you tense them really, really tight, you close off your capillaries and you hold them that way. When you release some of the blood, the flow comes right back fully oxygenated. So you can actually feel that, which is kind of cool. When you tense up your face really, really tight, you scrunch up your eyes and your face, it may look weird to others, but what happens is you see little patterns of light and color, spots of color and stuff like that. Because as you press in, you're pressing in on your retina as well. It's, triggering your occipital lobe to register sight when there isn't any. So as soon as you release that, it goes away. Well. It's not weird or abnormal. It's what you would expect. So you know, those are normal sensations and they'll pass away. So relaxing at will is a skill. The process takes time first to eventually be able to just think the you were relaxed and you'll feel your body respond to that. The more you practice, the better you get. Mind-body control can reduce your stress if you learn how to do it properly. It's just straight up the way it works. You can also see a therapist and learn more skills such as visualization and self-hypnosis, or you can get on the internet and learn how to do that stuff. It's not that hard to find materials. What you want to look at is finding whether or not they are 
good materials, right? Which is one of the things we're in college for, is to realize the difference between bogus information and valuable information. So you're looking for academic references and resources and things of that nature. Well, there's a book called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Dummies, and it's actually very good. And anybody who wants to, uh, who's motivated to do so, can read through, find out all the techniques they've learned from the therapist. And if they're motivated, they can apply them to themselves and see what the result is. It's usually a very positive thing. Unless you have severe psychopathology, in which case you always want to go a profession. Most people who take one of these things seriously find these two techniques are all they need to be effective. It helps them almost. Um, so, over my time, I'll talk a little bit. If you got questions, I'll take them. I'm just that good. <laughs> I believe that. All right, yes, okay. Real quick question. Yeah, don't let me believe that. <laughs> so, if you, is it imperative that you breathe out through your mouth? Because I know when I've done this, I always use my nose, but they always say mouth. And I've always wondered if it really matters. No, I don't think it really matters at all. It's really more about the control, it's really about getting the oxygen and carbon dioxide out. I think it's more comfortable for most people to breathe out through their mouth because it's less restricted in terms of feeling. Breathing in through a restricted uh, airway is not so weird as breathing out through a restricted airway. So, I think it's just more. Theoretically, it could, yeah. I mean, you get a lot of change. I, I really do. I mean, like I said, I've been doing this over a decade, but I don't practice it every day. But if I did practice it every day, I, I actually breathe differently naturally now. I usually breathe more to my stomach. You know, like when I become conscious of it and I'm not, it's a good shit to me. I it's just kind of like I can't say for a fact that it would, would change the way you breathe while you're asleep, uh, but it will relax you. It should make it easier to get asleep. Okay. Yes, good. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, in fact, what I would do, once you know that, is just kind of overemphasize that. Doing, you can test the groups as many times as you want to, right? The idea of doing it systematically is that you make sure you check in with all the muscle groups and you relax the whole body. But once you're relaxed, you can say, now I just want to overemphasize testing and releasing this group until it feels comfortable, until you feel the, the uh, tension release from it. Some people use massage methods, that would help too. Uh, so if you know somebody can give you a back massage, that's not a bad thing. Uh, you can do it yourself, and often that's easier to find something like that. Give you back sound. Yes. So, I don't want to touch on the subject of anxiety, but why is it that sometimes my people that seem to have higher levels of anxiety in terms of like they react to more things than most of them? That's a great question, and it's a complicated question, and since the answer is not completely easy to give, but to kind of sum it up, almost everything is on a normal distribution. Might mean most people are toward the middle mean. So some people it's really hard, very hard to get them to react anxiously to the situation. Some people it's very easy to get them to react anxiously to the situation. So some people are just naturally more prone to it. Some people we go to a thing called diathesis stress model of psychopathology, which posits that maybe people have some kind of genetic predisposition that's been activated by environmental stressors, that some people might have a lot more environmental stressors in their life, and that they once this is developed it's easier to activate, right? And so that might be the case that somebody's had panic problems or anxiety problems before, and thus it's quicker to trigger for them. They have a lower threshold for triggering adrenaline release than other people. Well, thank you all for your service to our ETSU community because it's a vital service that you provide, and thank you for your time. It's been my pleasure to talk to you today.